But I think it's very important to just stop for a minute and really think about the importance of imaging. So uh, with imaging, we can see many, many things in the brain. And really the alternative to imaging until about 20, 30 years ago was really to open the brain. So the fact that we can see in a non-invasive way what the brain does is extremely, extremely profound. And not just that we can see a few things, but we can see many, many different things. And here are just a few examples. We heard a lot about dopamine. We heard a lot about serotonin. We heard something about the cholinergic system. These are all different neurotransmitter systems. And we can investigate each one of them by using a technique, positive emission tomography, of which you've heard a lot uh, uh, coming to these meetings over the years. Um, this is a slide that John showed earlier, so we can also look at how different neurotransmitters are being released when you give an intervention, being levodopa, being transcranial magnetic stimulations, being just simply a gambling task, and so on. So we can look at that. MRI looks at anatomy, so again, we can look how brain is structured without having to open the brain. Um, another very, very um, 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 important and exciting technique which also uses MRI, is to look how the brain works at rest. So when we're just resting, there are different parts of the brain that work together. And you can see that those orange blobs are parts of the brain that work together, either when uh, we just think and do not, or we don't even think, whether we just try to relax, or whether we, um, whether there's a task that's related to vision, when we're just imagining seeing something, and so on. So that would be a resting state MRI. Very, very interesting. And the reason why it's so interesting, because I'll show you later on, is that disease and treatment impact even the way the brain works at rest. So very important. A technique that's slightly older is, is to look at how different parts of the brain work together when performing a certain task. So you're asked to solve a mathematical problem and some parts of the brain will become engaged. You're asked to perform a motor task, and you can see how some part of the brain become engaged. In this particular case, the stimulus was an olfactory stimulus, and you can see that if you compare controls or PD patients, different parts of the brain become engaged. So again, we can look at how brain functions, functions when exposed to different tasks in health, disease, age, and so on. Another thing that we can look at now is not just functional connectivity, i.e. how the brain works together when performing, how parts of the brain work together when performing a function, but also how different structures are connected uh, in the brain. And this is a relatively new technique that um, also stimulated a lot of very fancy, um, mathematically complex image analysis, uh, such as graph theory, um, in, and Martin's group is doing a lot of work on that, and we're starting to do that in PET as well. So I mentioned words, positive emission tomography and MRI. These are two, two techniques that are most commonly used. With PET, we look mostly at neurochemistry, i.e. various neurotransmitter systems. We can look at glucose utilization, how the brain uses energy. We can look at inflammation, tau imaging that Dr. Stosa was talking about earlier, that is all done with PET. With MRI, of which Martin is an expert, uh, we can look at connectivity, both structural and functional. We can look at how the brain responds to certain tasks, and also how the brain behaves when we're just simply resting. So I'll first show you some of the discoveries that were obtained by using PET. Some of them are old ones, some of them are newer ones. This is a slide that probably you have seen several times. The point here is we have been looking at the dopaminergic system, us and many others, for a very long time. And here we'll look, you can see visually the slide on the picture on your right is a uh, image of dopaminergic function in the Parkinson's subject. The one on your left is a control. And if we image people over time, we can see that the dopaminergic function using dopaminergic tracers declines over time very substantially. And the blue curves look at the bottom area, the posterior part of the putamen, and that is much decreased compared to the other curves. We look at a fairly uh, preserved part of the putamen. 
Zero is the time when symptoms occur and we see a large dopaminergic generation already when the symptoms occur. And that's a theme that you've heard throughout these talks. Now, this is one of the aspects. Another system that we can look with PET is a cholinergic system. Now here we see that the story is quite different. The first three rows show how the cholinergic system in Parkinson's is different from the cholinergic system in controls. And you see very little red, regardless whether that's early Parkinson's disease or advanced Parkinson's disease. But what you see in the last three rows, you see a lot of red. That means that the areas where there's a difference from healthy controls is very broad. And we see that the subject that were pulled in the three bottom rows are all subjects that had a component of dementia. So now we also subject to Parkinson's disease, but also had dementia. So now we see there's another system that's involved in Parkinson's disease that uh, influences or correlates with another aspect of disease, and that would be the cognitive function. Serotonergic system, that was one that was explored that Dr. Stolz mentioned earlier um, in the paper that was just accepted in Lancet Neurology. And we found, as he mentioned earlier, that this particular system works harder, is upregulated in patients at risk of Parkinson's disease or increased risk to their genetic mutations. Now, one of my students, Jessie, she also applied a connectivity type analysis to these subjects. And not only are the absolute values of certain energetic function higher than in controls, but also the correlation between different parts of the brain in terms of certain energetic function is different in these subjects compared to control. So we're learning that as well. Inflammation, these are recent data that we obtained the last year, and my postdoc, Ross Mabrum, Mabrak, was involved in this study. So what you can see there is on your left is a healthy control, but very little red or, um, or orange. On, on the slide in the middle, it's a subject with Parkinson's disease, and the one on the right is a subject at increased risk of Parkinson's disease without disease, you see much more yellow and orange, which means there's an increased inflammation both during the disease as well as it precede what can later on turn into disease. The whole hypothesis of inflammation being involved in Parkinson's disease has really been put forward by Pat McGear many, many decades ago. Here at UBC, he was first laughed at, but I think now he has his, um, um, his uh, time of triumph because indeed he's proven right, not just by us, but by others as well. So this is what we're learning with PET. What are we learning with MRI-based techniques? Well, um, there are um, many, many studies now that, as I mentioned earlier, show a different pattern in connectivity, both when the brain is addressed and when the brain is asked to perform a certain task. For example, here's a, we're looking at resting state and we're looking at sensory motor network. And we see that in controls, those are the areas that light up. And we see that in the Parkinson's disease case, when the patient is off medication, the middle part, the uh, areas that light up are quite different. But then we can also see that once they're administered levodopa, the picture becomes much closer to that that's observed in controls. So we can not only look at differences of functional disease, but we can also look at the effect of treatment. Now this is a very complex slide, but the only point I want to make here is what those dots represent there are various measures of connectivity. What you see on the bottom is disease severity as measured by UPDRS scores. And the only important point from this slide is that the connectivity does change in different areas of the brain in different ways, depending on disease state. So this is all, this is another information that we can learn from MRI-based techniques. So now, I hope I convinced you, 20 years ago or so, and my colleague neurologist may correct me on the date, but uh, many, many years ago, PD was thought to be predominantly a disease, or almost exclusively, a disease of the dopaminergic system. What we know now is it is much, much, much more to the disease. First of all, that could be reasons for its origin that, that originate in the gut, but also in terms of brain 
performance. There's many more systems that are affected in terms of neurochemistry, but there's also connectivity that is being affected. We didn't know this 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the story is very, very complex. Now this fits very well into what is the most recent, a recent hypothesis uh, for many brain diseases, is that they're complex. And it is a very, very strong interaction between neurochemical alterations and connectivity. What comes first, we don't know. What causes what, we don't know. These are all questions that need an answer. Now, I was talking PET, neurochemistry, MRI, connectivity. We want to know how the two are connected. So, what, so then, uh, if we could have an instrument that can measure together both the neurochemistry and connectivity-related issues, possibly, we could start answering questions of how the two, uh, or how all of these different aspects of brain dysfunction interact. And indeed, there is such a scanner. It became commercially available approximately five, six years ago. And this is something that we just put in an application to CIFI to acquire such a scanner. Now, um, what kind of imaging does this enable? Again, a complex slide. The point is that many of those measurements that I've been showing you before separately, now we can do at the same time. For example, if we give an intervention, we can at the same time see how it changes neurochemistry and how it changes the connectivity. Um, so with such a machine, we could uh, answer a few more questions. For example, uh, does Parkinson's disease disrupt uh, brain energy and utilization. And I'll show you why we need both to answer this question. It was, Dr. Stosa talked about a lot about exercise. Now with this machine, we can, deep, um, we can go deeper into the exploration of the mechanisms by which exercise can confer some degree of neuro neuroprotection. And finally, because we have a more complex story that we can tell, we can really start to explore effects of treatment on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, which again ties well with what Dr. Farah was saying, that the long-term goal is really to have treatment on, a, to define optimal treatment on a subject basis. This is just some uh, few examples. These are not our data, because of course we don't have such a machine yet. But here, we, we, what you can see is you can look at the energy utilization by PET, FDG, and the blood flow changes with MRI. So you can really start to dis, uh, find algorithms that would look at the cost in terms of energy of brain function. So how expensive it is for the brain to perform a certain function by looking at FDG uptake. Uh, and how does this change as the function of the disease? How does this change after treatment? Again, this is a study that Dr. Stosa was uh, um, showing earlier. Here we saw a treatment-induced dopamine release. Now, it would be very interesting if at the same time we could see how the brain function towards connectivity changes and how this really influences cognition. Or we could also now look at how much of dopamine release influences how much of brain connectivity that then we could really follow this as a function of intervention. So these are all questions that we could answer with the machine. Now you're asking me why you have both the PET and you have the MRI, why can't you simply repeat the same study in the two machines? Now there's evidence that both blood flow and let's say glucose uptake varies up to 10 to 20% throughout the day. Depending whether you're tense or anxious, you might respond differently to a certain stimulus. So you may release, release more or less dopamine depending in what kind of an anxiety state you are. So if we were to do these measurements separately, we would have quite a large confound in our data. And this is really shown here in a schematic diagram. Assume that you have two groups, let's say circles, subject from group one, um, your triangle subjects from group two, if we were to perform two separate measurements, let's say we could not, because there's such an uncertainty in what you're measuring, you could not easily separate the two groups. Now, if we do it simultaneously, our measurements are much more accurate. So our probability to be able to separate the two groups is a lot higher. 
So um, this is the main motivation for the PET MRI. This again, it's a very complex slide, but the only take home message here is that this is an analysis that my student Ivan Klusen was doing and Martin was referring to. Here we're looking at uh, patterns of dopaminergic function in the bright colors superimposed on the MRI defined anatomy. And we found that if we combine these two types of information, even with separately acquired images, with some more advanced mathematical algorithms, we can predict from imaging this is severity a lot more accurately. Why is this important? If you want to look at any effect of intervention, if you can predict better how the disease uh, course changes, you can look at the effects of intervention much more accurately. Um, why we think we could take advantage of such a machine, we have expertise both in PET and MRI. And so combining the two, uh, in a very synergistic way for this center would be relatively easy. In addition, a patient would need to undergo less scans because some of these scans would be acquired simultaneously, which means less visits, which means that especially for those subjects like mutation carriers and so on, um, it would be, uh, it would, the probability of them going through an entire study protocol would be quite a lot higher. Just to give you a background, now there's two commercial scanners available, a G and Siemens, the two manufacturers that make it. There's about 150 of them in the world, uh, of which six in Canada, primarily used for oncology. In the last couple of years in the UK alone, five were acquired just to study dementia. So there's a lot of scientific interest for this machine. Um, we submitted an application in October, and now we're crossing everything we can possibly cross um, to be successful and we'll know that in June 2017. Where would this instrument be located? Just across the hall. If you go out and you look at the wall, um, the area here is behind the wall, and the blue area uh, is the one where the PET MR would be located. The dark gray area is where the 3T MRI, for which the CIFA application was successful, will be located in the next calendar year. Now, just before concluding, there's another aspect that's very synergistic here. Parkinson's disease uh, here, uh, the clinic for it, lives amongst clinics for other diseases. And uh, there's research in many other diseases. Now, there is synergy from being able to exchange information between different diseases. For example, healthy aging. People that age in a very healthy way they must have some mechanisms that do allow them to age in a healthy way. So perhaps by exploring that, we can get some hint in what could confirm some degree of neuroprotection. Now, if we know that, that can inform therapies for Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, for mood disorders, and for addiction. In fact, all of these diseases were mentioned in the CFI application. This commonality between diseases, for example, inflammation, is deemed to play a role in Parkinson's, in Alzheimer's, and in multiple sclerosis. Those are the gray uh, squares there. Abnormal protein aggregations, Parkinson's, as you've heard from previous talk, as well as Alzheimer's. So whatever we learn from one disease, we can apply that knowledge to another disease. So that's another type of synergy that we have by living in this environment where we can exchange information with researchers and clinicians that do investigate other brain disorders. So with that, um, I think these times here are quite exciting. So there is a new approach to disease understanding. We're not focusing on one system, one aspect, but we're really trying to understand the correlation between them. And further, not just how the brain functions, but also what is genetic, the role of genetics, what is the role of the microbiome, so really, we're starting to look at different diseases in a very comprehensive way, uh, which I think is going to build, bring the field forward. Also, being an imaging person, I'm very excited that we're starting to have instrumentation that can give answers to this, or at least we hope it can, to this much more complex question. So it mirrored the complexity of the instrumentation now is mirroring the complexity of the understanding. And of course, 
what you really all want to have is to understand the disease, to find treatment, and even better, to find prevention.